So what brings you here to the 2013 Planetary Defense Conference? So I was in Washington for a NASA review and managed to get out and catch the last two days of the conference. Uh, we're here mostly to present uh, an idea for asteroid mitigation and uh, it's, um, some work we've been doing for the last couple of years. And it was a good opportunity. I didn't know the conference existed before I um, started this project, but it's a great audience for this kind of work. It's ideal. And can you describe your concept? It's called the DE star system, and it's a laser-based system that could be used for asteroid deflection, correct? Uh, it can be used both for deflection of asteroids as well as for direct evaporation of asteroids, uh, amongst other uses. But it, it was initially designed um, to allow us to evaporate asteroids up to 500 meters in diameter completely in the course of approximately one year. So that was our, our sort of intellectual marching orders were, you know, I said, here's our goal. Can we take some other things we've been doing and, and apply it at a much uh, higher level? And is it feasible to do this? And so we, we set as a target 500 meters. We were looking at POFAS as a, as a candidate, which is about 300 meters. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it, it turns out that uh, we, we set a baseline requirement of approximately 500 meters over a year, complete evaporation, not just oh. deflection. So it was a you know it was worst case scenario, uh -huh. absolutely worst case, um, and then we decided that we'd like to begin to engage the asteroids. I begin the evaporation process at uh, greater than one AU. One AU is the mean distance, the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. Uh -huh. So these are very large distances to do something like this at. But we set it as a goal to see if it was possible to do this, and that's what evolved in into what, what you see here. Um, the system is, um, is modular in, in the sense you can build small versions of it, uh -huh. um, not for taking out asteroids, but for testing. So it doesn't require you to build the whole system to, to validate it, which is one of the other things I wanted to do, is make sure that we didn't have to spend you know, billions of dollars to build something and then find out that we made some mistake along right. the way. So we propose a system which is very logical and, and based on uh, a number of existing technologies which are already very compelling. We don't require any technological miracle for this mm -hmm. project, which is another requirement I had. That it should be something possible to do, even if difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and that we wanted it to be modular so that you could test it without spending a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And then work your way up and find out what the problems are and then solve the problems um, or find that they're not solvable in, in the near term. But so far we haven't found any problems that are not solvable. But we do see technological challenges, but it does not require any completely um, new technology at this mm -hmm. point. It does require uh, a lot of engineering detail, and it does require us to be able to launch and assemble, mostly assemble, large structures in space. Uh -huh. the, the modularity allows you to send up subcomponents mm -hmm. that then are assembled into the larger components. You don't have to send the whole thing up at once at all. And send up very small things and robotically build it. Mm -hmm. So this would be utilizing <clears throat> solar radiation, converting it into electricity, and then converting that into a laser-based system, which could vaporize either the surface or the in, potentially the entirety of an asteroid. Yeah. So, so in a nutshell, the basic idea is that you want to form a spot on the asteroid and raise the temperature, the effective temperature of that spot, high enough that all known elements will evaporate. Uh -huh. And the way you do that is you have to have an, a, a system which is large enough, an optical system, and we'll, we'll worry about the phased array part later. You simply have to have an optical system which is large enough to focus a beam at large enough distances so that it's intense enough to begin the evaporation process. And that mm -hmm. requires surface temperatures at the asteroid of roughly two to 3,000 degrees Kelvin. So hot enough to, to vaporize uh, almost all known elements. Some elements we have to get up into the four to 5,000 degree Kelvin, things like you know, if you had a solid carbon asteroid or solid diamond asteroid, which would be, uh, uh, that would be interesting, yeah. which you know, nothing that we know of exists like that. But, um, but it, we have the ability to vaporize basically every known element. So once you do that, once you form a spot which is small enough and intense enough, then you have to ask yourself how are you going to power such a system and how much power do you need, of course. And the answer is that if you want to 
evaporate asteroids at about one EU or a little bit beyond, you need a system which is about 10 kilometers in size, between mm -hmm. one and 10 kilometers in size. So 10 kilometers is six miles. So it's not a small structure. Mm -hmm. the, the International Space Station, for reference, is a tenth of a kilometer in size, approximately 100 meters. This would be 100 times larger in each dimension. Mm -hmm. So you know, a formidable uh, assembly project in space. Mm -hmm. Not impossible, but formidable. Um, and, no, it's okay. You could, it's okay. Um, so the, the, the question of power then comes immediately in, into play because mm -hmm. in, in order to do what we want, we want to be able to provide approximately 70 gigawatts of laser power. Mm -hmm. And at the efficiency, the current efficiency of lasers, which is actually quite good, uh, lasers now, the type that we're using, are already close to 50% efficient, between 35 and 50%. There were some reports recently of 69% efficiency. They're, they're already amazingly efficient. Hmm. So there's not much room left to go on that front for efficiency. There are other areas where we need to improve. But the size of the system um, that is required to form the small spot also turns out to be just about the right size to be powered by the sun through converting sunlight into electricity via photovoltaics. So you don't need any other power source on board. You don't need any reactors, nothing else, just solar uh, photovoltaics. Hmm. And those two together um, give you a system which is capable of both powering the lasers and forming the spot on the asteroid to completely obliterate an asteroid, uh, completely evaporate. In worst case analysis, mm -hmm. completely bring it down to the atomic or molecular level, depending on the composition, um, so that nothing's left of the asteroid except the vapor, which is um, in space. And that is clearly a worst case analysis. Mm -hmm. What actually happens along the way in the process of forming the, uh, the intense spot, which begins the vaporization process, as you can imagine, if you're boiling a pot of water, the water vapor which is coming off the pot is actually pushing down on the surface of the water. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't notice it because it's, it's a small effect. Mm -hmm. But in this case, the amount of thrust on the asteroid from the ejected material coming off the asteroid, which mm -hmm. is therefore pushing back on the asteroid, just action and reaction, that thrust is the approximately equivalent to the shuttle uh, SRB, the solid rocket booster. Enormous thrust. So you can, you don't have to well. vaporize the asteroid completely. You can certainly push it off course dramatically compared to any of the other existing technologies of using gravity tractors or putting small ion engines, which are a few pounds of thrust. Right. Um, this thing puts on the order of a million pounds of thrust. Wow on the asteroid. So it's a phenomenal amount of thrust. And it's, um, anyway, it, that's one of <coughs> one of the uses. We Actually, when we started this, the other thing we wanted in such a system was not to only be able to interdict asteroids, to be able to go out and um, deflect them or vaporize them as needed, but we want something which would also be useful for other purposes mm -hmm. so that the money spent on it would be returned in other ways. Mm -hmm. So if we want, we could talk about that as well. But, um, we looked at spacecraft propulsion, for example. Uh -huh. It turns out that the, the photon pressure um, on the reflector of a spacecraft is such that you could get roughly from, from here to Mars in approximately three days with a 100 kilogram class um, robotic uh, spacecraft. So that's a small spacecraft, a couple hundred pounds. So that, that's basically having this thing in orbit around the Earth and then Correct. beaming the power to the spacecraft? Correct. So it just it pushes on the spacecraft. And because it pushes on the spacecraft continuously, mm -hmm. uh, it's not like a, a, in a chemical rocket. What normally happens in a, in a mission, say, to Mars or to the moon, is you, you, know, you fire your chemical rocket to get off the Earth. Most of it's gone by the time you get up into orbit. And then if you want to go to the moon, you fire it for a little while, and you, you, know, you don't leave it on the whole time. It, you don't have enough fuel. This system is on basically all the time if you want. Mm -hmm. So you, now there are issues, as we discussed earlier, you know, what do you do when you get to Mars in such a system? Because right. it's going at a phenomenal speed. By the time it gets to Mars, for a 100 kilogram class robotic system, it's going uh, over 1,000 kilometers per second. Wow. Amazing speeds. In fact, that's high enough to exit the galaxy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually higher than the escape velocity of the galaxy. Wow. The solar system, you blow uh -huh. right through the solar system. Now, it takes a while to get out of the solar system, um, but 
you're going at phenomenal speeds compared to any chemical propulsion system that we have envisioned. So it has applications. I think the whole idea of propelling spacecraft via this technique is something to look at. You have to understand that you want to be able to do more with the spacecraft than just go past Mars. You want to actually orbit Mars and land. Mm -hmm. So as we discussed earlier, there, there are issues that one has to deal with in terms of how do you slow down once you get there? You know, do, do you carry an ion engine on board that you power from this thing? Because this is a phenomenal power source. You basically have left your power. You have, you have a plug and a long power cord. Right. You just don't have any mass in the power cord that you're dragging with you. Um, so it has uses. If you think about anything where you want massive amounts of power, um, this might have some uses for that purpose. And the other, like, like for example, the picture of the space shuttle how much of the mass of the rocket you see leaving the Earth is actually the shuttle you want to get out to your location versus fuel you got to take with you to get up off the Earth and then to get out to your destination. So you're saying we could take that uh, power source and not have to take it with us and be able to provide even more power throughout the whole travel process, correct? Correct. And so there are applications where this is appropriate and there are applications where it's not appropriate. So mm -hmm. one has to, you know, carefully analyze where you would use this. But basically that's correct. If you calculate the amount of power in the shuttle solid rocket booster, so there's the two solid rockets on the side, mm -hmm. they have approximately 10 to 20 gigawatts of power each. Uh -huh. Now we don't normally think about them in terms of power, we think about them in terms of thrust. But if you calculate the power, they're, they're roughly 10 to 20 gigawatts. Mm. The, the power of this system is, in the, in the baseline system for the DE Star 4 system, is 70 gigawatts of of, of photon power. Hmm. So it's not surprising then that you might conclude that the thrust equivalent that you might be able to induce on the asteroid would be comparable to the shuttle. Now this does not have an optimal nozzle design on the asteroid. No one designed the nozzle on the asteroid for uh -huh. us. But um, we lose a factor of a couple there in terms of efficiency. Um, but we still uh, have very large thrust in the asteroid. So in terms of uh, propelling a spacecraft, <clears throat> you don't use the thrust from the ablation of the spacecraft, you could, uh -huh. so that is possible. Uh -huh. So there is a mode where you use a system to drive an onboard uh, propellant, but not in the sense of a normal propellant, it's uh -huh. simply being used as a mass that you eject. In that sense, it's somewhat akin to an ion engine, mm. except you don't need the power, you don't carry the power with you for the ion engine, you, you send it via this technique. Mm -hmm. And it's, it has vastly higher power per unit area than the sunlight. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you don't need to carry with you such a large amount of, of say, solar panels with you on the spacecraft. So there, there may be some interesting applications there. We've been looking at some of those. Um, you know, another one is to be able to look at the composition of asteroids by, uh, again, uh, basically starting the evaporation process. You then eject material. But in the ejection process, you have a very hot surface um, on the asteroid, and so you can see that hot surface through a telescope. And so you know you have a, a backlight, and you have material which is being ejected. And so mm -hmm. we've been looking at the possibility of analyzing the ejected material. Mm -hmm. So this might be useful for people that want to mine asteroids. They'd like to know what is it made out of. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, we sometimes call a standoff solution. Might be a standoff solution for that to determine the composition. Mm -hmm. You can also change the trajectory of asteroids. So if you want to. Um, harvest them. This allows you to uh, do that in some applications. Mm -hmm. What seems so incredible about this is you're talking about speed of light action, basically. So to yeah. go out and, you know, figure out what an asteroid's made out of, currently we'd have to send a whole mission out there. It would take a long time to get there. It'd be very expensive to build the whole system to get to it. Mm -hmm. Here you could have a capability already existing, and then from that capability, speed of light action, you could decide, I want to see what that one's made out of. I want to move that one around. It just seems like an incredible capability. That's, that's correct. So th this is designed to be a multitasking system. Mm -hmm. even, um, it doesn't actually even have to point in one direction only. It can simultaneously send out different beams. Oh. Because it's a, it's a phased array, it can simultaneously send out essentially as many beams as you want. So you could be both propelling a spacecraft and analyzing composition of an asteroid and evaporating another asteroid and, you know, some other sending power to, to a lunar base. You know, the, the way the system is built, it can do multiple things at once. Um, but that, that's basically correct. What you said is that 
you're not taking with you your power system. You're leaving it at home, mm -hmm. and you're sending it at the speed of light. So it takes approximately eight minutes for light to get from the Earth to 1 AU, mm -hmm. which is the amount of time it takes for sunlight to get to the Earth. Mm -hmm. And so you can, you know, eight minutes after you turn the thing on, you can begin to, um, you know, inter intercept an asteroid at 1 AU. Um, Similarly, you can you know propel a spacecraft by using the light to push on the spacecraft, and you don't have to carry the propulsion system. But again, you know there are limits of this technology. You'd want to apply it appropriately, like any technology. But the interesting thing is, we don't we don't require a, a miracle to get this to go. Right? We don't need antimatter drives. We don't need warp drives. We don't need even fusion drives. Although we, we hope that those will come someday. Um, but using technologies which both exist now and are rapidly evolving, um, we can uh, not only imagine this a system, but we can actually build small versions of this system mm -hmm. and then work our way up to a final system, to, to a larger system. Maybe one last broader question, because we're here at the 2013 Planetary Defense Conference, and there's a lot of discussion on the role of asteroids and comets impacting Earth and affecting life on Earth. It's also growing attention to space weather, for example, the role of solar activity potentially affecting life on Earth. And it seems like mankind more and more is being confronted that we're not just living on Earth. The Earth is a small part of the whole solar system. The solar system is a part of a galaxy. And if we're going to continue to progress and exist in these systems, we've got to be thinking about the solar system first, then Earth, broader pictures, then Earth. Do you, do you have anything to comment on that, that view that mankind seems to be moving towards? Yeah, I, I would hope we could put aside our, our petty squabbles and truly deal with things which are you know, meaningful in life and, and working together to, to go out and, you know, place ourselves on the moon as a near-term mission. Some, you know, have a base on the moon. Mm -hmm. is a laudable mission to, to do the same with Mars and then to work our way out. Hopefully, eventually, we could get out of the solar system. Um, one of the things that we... And so I draw the distinction sort of between things which are realistic to um, to come to fruition, mm -hmm. say, in a lifetime, versus those things which are perhaps several lifetimes out. And so one of the things is you could ask yourself, suppose you go further than simply wanting to deal with asteroids or propel spacecraft in our solar system, what could you do? Mm -hmm. So if you step up and you ask, what would happen if you scaled this up even larger? Mm -hmm. Could you build a system which could propel a spacecraft to the nearest stars? Mm -hmm. Um, and so we spend some of our time in, in our papers looking at this issue. And you, you can, in theory, and, and I'm not saying this is practical at the moment, it's not, but if you follow the same evolutionary approach, again, you don't need new technology here. You need to be able to assemble things in space which are very large. So that's, that requires an evolutionary approach to our ability to both launch mm. and assemble in space. So those are areas that we need to work on. But if one scales up, one could you can conclude that if you go to a DE star six, you can then uh, propel a 10,000 kilogram spacecraft, which is, uh, is uh, you know, basically 20, uh, 10 tons, mm -hmm. um, at near the speed of light, near the speed of light, not at the speed of light, near the speed of light, so that you could imagine a, an interplan interstellar probe wow. uh, someday, without warp drive, without fusion drive. Now. We have the same problems. What do you do when you get there? You know, how do you slow down? Because you're going real fast. Um, but it brings up some fascinating possibilities. I wouldn't advocate sending people there in the beginning, send out robotic probes. But I am very much an advocate of sending out probes into not only the solar system, but beyond. And, 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 you know, and we can decide what we want to do with those probes. But I think what you said before is, is, is key to one of the differences between this and other approaches. In many of the other approaches in dealing with asteroids, mm -hmm. one sends a mission to an asteroid to deflect the asteroid. One sends a mission to analyze the material. One sends a mission to put on an ion engine on the asteroid to you know, change its orbit. Mm -hmm. In our approach, we don't do that. We stand off and we start by being we just stay at the Earth or on the Moon or at the Lagrange point. There are different places you could put this. Mm -hmm. And we say, let us you know, you know, use the fact that we can travel with our energy at the speed of light to the object and let us, use, let us uh, work on the system that way rather than having to mount a mission to every asteroid we think we might be a threat. Right. And the great advantage is here, and I think in, in the long run, if you do the analysis, you probably figure out this is a, a much cheaper way to do it. 
Absolutely. Because yeah. you don't have to launch a mission, which, which using chemical propulsion systems can take years mm -hmm. to get to an asteroid. And then, you know, what do you do when you get there? Mm -hmm. So this, this is a different approach altogether. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to explain this interesting concept for us. I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to add. No, I, I think maybe one way for those of, the, those of you that are <clears throat> watching this um, to think about <clears throat> things that are related to, uh, to what we're doing. If you go into the hardware store mm -hmm. and you, you look at an LED light bulb and you ask yourself, you know, what went into this LED light bulb and why is it so much better than an incandescent light bulb? Mm -hmm. And why should I buy this light bulb versus, you know, a compact fluorescent or an incandescent? Well, I agree. At the moment, the choice between buying a compact version and buying an LED is a tough choice because it's an economic choice. But uh, that, the economy of that is changing very rapidly. The same technological revolution, the same photonics and electronic revolution, which makes the LED possible mm -hmm. in your little, there's light somewhere. I don't know. There's an LED somewhere around here sure. in your, in your, in your in your uh, PowerPoint laser pointer, uh -huh. in your LED light bulb and your flashlight, in your LED light bulb that you buy for your home, that same technology is in fact what's driving the possibility of making this mm. a reality. It's the conversion of electricity into light at high efficiency. Mm. And that has now gotten to the point where one can not only envision something like this, but one can begin to build something like this. Mm. Well, it's very exciting. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you very much.